for tuning into Balanced Black Girl Podcast. My name is Les. I am your host. This podcast is all about conversations that help us feel healthy, happy, thriving. So all month long in February, we are talking about friendships on the podcast because last February, I had an episode about platonic intimacy that I was like, this is a great conversation. I think the girlies are going to like it. And it turns out the girlies loved it. And I was like, okay, we need to dive deeper into this topic. We need to talk more about friendships, how they impact our well-being, how we navigate them through different seasons of life. And I am very excited to welcome an incredible guest who is the best in the biz at talking about friendships. Please join me in welcoming Danielle B.R. Jackson, who is just our favorite friendship <laughs> expert, also host of the Friend Forward podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I've been listening to your show for a while. And so this is a really cool opportunity to sit and have this very important conversation with you. Oh my gosh. I'm <laughs> so, so happy to have you. So first off, I mean, we're still getting settled into this new year. How, how's 2024 treating you? How are you doing? You know, I said my word for the year is ease. Mm. And it's just so funny because, you know, you get to going, especially when that's your natural default setting is to hustle. And so I have to actively remind myself, hold on a second. We're only in like a couple of weeks deep. Yeah. Take a breath. So it's something I'm, I'm continuously working on. What about you? So what's funny, and this might be kind of an answer that people may not expect, is that I'm almost feeling the opposite where I'm leaning into a season where I'm kind of hitting the gas pedal a little bit. And I use the word season very specifically because it's not forever. I'm mm -hmm. not going to be like hustling girl boss for forever. Mm -hmm. But I realize I have an opportunity to kind of rise to the occasion for some of the goals that I have. And so I've been very focused on kind of powering through and rising to the occasion. Oh, I love that for you. Yeah, to ride that energy I think is super important. But it's temporary because I'm going to be ready for some ease. <laughs> Give me Q2. going to be a different answer. We'll check in. We'll circle back. We'll circle back. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So like I mentioned, I'm super excited to have you here because friendship is a topic that our audience takes to so much. I mean, it's something that we all deal with in one way or another, whether we are struggling with friendships as we navigate different seasons of life or moving to a new city. And I would love to talk to you a bit more about friendships, about your work in friendship. You've also had a really dynamic career, starting off in education, now a friendship expert. Can we talk a little bit about how your experience in education led to the work you do now? Yeah, it's so funny because whenever I'm at like a party or something and you get that inevitable like, so what do you do mm -hmm. question, I just brace myself because I'm just like, you know, a little this, a little that. Because uh, people still kind of give you the eyebrow lift of suspicion, like is friendship coach a real job? Um, but it's, it's not necessarily something I set out to do. I was a high school teacher for about six years, and then I became the academic chair of one of the largest departments and the largest schools in the county. And um, and it was a lot. And so when I was there between classes and after school, I mean, the main thing students wanted to talk about was friendship stuff. And so I kind of had like this front row seat to watch the ways in which issues of connection and belonging were directly impacting everything else, their confidence, academic performance, uh, whether or not they came to class. And so it was just such an interesting vantage point, especially for young women specifically to watch their dynamics, okay? And so I left that world and then I got into public relations. And so I made the foolish mistake of thinking, oh, I'm leaving that teenage drama behind because I'm working with these women. And I learned very quickly that despite being high achieving extroverted women, they too privately had issues with friends. And so I was like, I went on Amazon one day, I searched friendship books. And at the time there were very few results. And of the results that came up, they were mostly for children. And that's when I was like, wow, okay. So that's what we think of friendship, that surely a child might need help with it, but adults should have it figured out. And so for the past six years, I have made a living by studying what the research has to say about women's connection, cooperation, communication. And I just see my role as kind of making that uh, research accessible and actionable for people. And so far it's been um, a blessing to be in this space. That is beautiful. And I think it's such a good point that a lot of the things that we maybe experience or have a hard time with when we're young don't magically change mm -hmm. just because we're older. A lot of the ways that we relate to one another are very similar. Mm -hmm. It just might be about a different thing or a different connection point or maybe a little bit more complex as an adult. 
but it's the same kind of relations that we have. Yeah. Hopefully we're getting better at maturing at certain things, not being as tender. But I mean, it's never something you were talking before we got started. It's never something you fully arrive at. Like, oh, I've got friendship right. I mean, I hope that sometimes you're in a season where everything feels like it's just sinking up and you have a rhythm. And I mean, that's beautiful. But inevitably, there's going to be something because you are bringing your own specific goals, needs, and desires to the table. And so is your friend. So don't you think at some point there might be competing interests and now we kind of have to do the work of figuring out, okay, how, how are we going to do this here? And for some of us, it's a skill we're just constantly having to, to cultivate. Do you find that some people are adults and maybe this is why there was not as much literature there. As adults, we don't prioritize friendships as much as we do when we're younger because we have other things. We begin to have careers, we have partners, we have kids, and it can be hard to put in the work for friendships. Have you found that in the research? Oh, totally. And I think that um, the the literature that we do have available and how it kind of drops off at a certain age is reflective of what the research shows. And that is that uh, your social network grows and grows exponentially until about the age of 26, at which point it begins to dwindle. And it's funny because that's the point where young women start to come to me, mid-20s. Um, and it's because of all the things you just said. You know, maybe we're on track, we're in the same bubble and we have the same schedule even until that age. And now we're prioritizing different things. Some of your friends are really serious about establishing uh, family ties. They want to settle down. Some are very focused on their career. So they're putting in extra hours because it's important to them to, to start advancing. You know, so we have competing schedules and interests and it does kind of take us in different directions and it can be, I feel like it's hard to kind of circle back. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I would love to get into maybe some of the strategies and ways that people can start prioritizing friendships if they're realizing, hey, this area of my life needs some love. I need to show it some attention. Yeah. Um, I will say for me, one of the most freeing realizations I've had as I've gotten older is understanding that it's okay if friendships look different than they did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I think when you're a kid or a teenager, you get very hung up on the idea of I have this best friend. We do everything together. I tell them everything. We have our matching friendship bracelets mm -hmm. and they are everything. And then when we get older, it's hard for people to be our everything. Yeah. And I've learned how to have kind of different friends that I connect with in different ways. I have some friends who I meet up for a workout with and some friends who I meet up and co-work with and mm -hmm. some friends who I like to go out with. And allowing those friendships to serve those purposes has actually felt really freeing. Is that something that the literature supports? Is it helpful for people? It is. Okay. So there's research that finds that people who have relational diversity are happier so the person who has the church friend, the mom friend, the happy hour friend, the wellness friend is probably f experiencing more life satisfaction than the person who has sister and bestie. And, you know, I always hesitate there because I don't want people to take from that, oh, I got to act like an extrovert and go make all these friends. That's that's not the case. But my thought is that if a person has a lot of different connections, it probably speaks to them being plugged in in the world and doing lots of things. So you having your workout buddy, it signals that you go to the gym or you take care of yourself in that way. Or, you know, if you have your church friends, it probably indicates you're plugged into a religious community, which has a lot of rituals that connects people. So being plugged into the world, one natural byproduct of that is having different kinds of connections. And then that's how we get access to different resources. That's how people put me on to certain things. I'm like, oh my God, girl, that my bestie would not know. She's not in that world. That's how I get support for, you know, certain lifestyles. And I'm affirmed for my intersectional identities. So it's important. And I love the word you use about being, you know, feeling like it's freeing to have different kinds of friends. Um, now, I think, you know, there will be varying degrees of closeness maybe, but to have different kinds of friends is, is really beneficial for your wellness and your happiness. Yeah. I love the term you use, relational diversity. Mm -hmm. That's that's really cool. I think part of what helped me with that was that I did have friends who I was like, I want them to be my everything. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm I'm like, well, this person actually is really great at showing up for our workout and she's not that great at showing up at this other thing. No tea, no shade. Yeah. It just is what it is. So if I just let her show up for the things that she's good for and I don't look to her for more than she's able to give, that's where the feeling freed part comes in. Yes. So I say that so that people don't feel like they need to then go out and meet a bunch of different people and pluck them into certain areas of your yeah. life. It's probably people you know who are good in showing up in certain ways. Let them be that and don't expect 
if you don't have that closeness or that intimacy built with them, expect them to be something that they're just not or unable to give. Yeah. And I think it's important too for just like more joy in the friendship because the research does tell us that women have higher expectations in their close relationships. So romantically and in friendships, we expect more, especially in the areas of self-disclosure and reciprocity. We expect more than men do. And so I think one way to help us experience more satisfaction is to manage our expectations in that way. So instead of me being disappointed that she uh, does not respond in the way I like when I'm venting emotionally, you know, I can either push there and tell her what I'd like, or I can just say, you know what, I'm going to accept that that's not her thing. And that's okay. And, you know, well, she'll be my party friend and, and that's okay. And I'll manage. Um, so, you know, I know for some people that's disenchanting, but I think it starts to help you see the abundance in your friendship landscape when you can look at it from that way. That's such a good mindset to mm -hmm. have, the, the abundance of letting people show up as they are. Mm -hmm. You also just said something really interesting that women tend to have higher expectations of their friends can we talk a little bit more about what that means and how that tends to show up and how we interact with one another? Yeah. So the research shows that um, women tend to perceive more violations than men do in their friendships. So, you know, I mean, there are all these running jokes about it and comedy sketches and stuff around, you know, a woman being like, did you see that? And a guy being like, well, hey, what did she do? You know, but there are certain things where like, okay, this is not okay. This is obviously not okay. And my theory is just that, you know, a lot of times we say, you know, women have a sixth sense and we just believe a lot of things should be intuitive and we just know because we're a woman. And I'm wondering if in our friendships with other women, if I assume that because you're another woman, you should know, like you should know, girl, I shouldn't have to say how to respond, when to respond, what I need and how to support me because you're another woman. So you should get it. And then I think that's only compounded by a tendency we have to not articulate what we need. Because again, I feel like if we have chemistry as friends, I shouldn't have to say it. And me saying it detracts from the chemistry we're supposed to have. And so I, when you put it all together, you have a lot of us feeling uh, dissatisfied um, and and maybe even resentful um, because we won't communicate what we need um, or because we won't kind of manage expectations in that way. That is so interesting. Do you think that that gets exacerbated as we go through different seasons of life? Like some of the life events where I think people's friendships tend to reach some friction is, you know, if a friend gets married or if mm. a friend has a child, then maybe that friend has these expectations of, well, my friend should know what I need, but maybe they haven't experienced that life event yet. So they genuinely don't know. And it could create some tension. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's so interesting because I, mean, I don't want to be offensive, but I feel like- Just say it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you're safe, girl. Let it all out. It's a safe space. You know, <laughs> I, I just feel like women do have so many changes in the woman's life cycle. Um, and sometimes, you know, men don't. And there's even research to sometimes support that like even when a man gets married, like his life gets better and a married woman's life they report less satisfaction. And it's probably because we we do so much and we're expected to step into so many roles. Emotionally, we're sometimes his support and just all the things. Uh, taking on more of the domestic labor. Like there's just so many shifts in our health and just all these things. I say that to say, you know, when you put a group of women together, I don't know what season you're in and what period you're in. And, you know, so there's a lot of experiences maybe we haven't had and unique obligations we're experiencing. And so you're right because the research does show that the number one thing women expect in their female friendships is emotional support, which is great. I know I do. I'm like, okay, if anything, girl, I need you to be able to like help me out or why are you here? Okay. So I get it. The only thing is, again, we don't normally articulate what that is. And so I've noticed that a lot of us are using the same language, but having different conversations because we're all going to nod eagerly and be like, yes, support. But when I go the next step and I'm like, and what does that look like for you? Like if I watched your friend support you, what would my eyes see? And we're often saying different things. And so at some point I do have to say, hey, so, you know, you know, having this newborn is really, really hard. And I have FOMO and I feel like I'm being forgotten and I feel overwhelmed. And so I don't know if you could just, you know, invite me, even though sometimes I can't come. I don't know. It just makes me feel like you guys were thinking of me. That doesn't make you thirsty, clingy, needy. But how else do friends know what 
what support looks like. They, you guys have never had practice being friends in this way. So kind of giving yourself grace to say, as a unit, we've never done this before. So, you know, there's there's room to kind of negotiate what this might look like for us. I love that. And, and navigating kind of those different friendship evolutions mm -hmm. instead of, okay, you hit that speed bump and then you just think, okay, we can't be friends anymore. This is, this is too hard or they don't support me. Yeah. What about those instances where people don't know how to support you or they're unable to or don't have either the tools or the capacity to? Yeah. You know, that's really tricky. Um, and can feel really hurtful. I think if like somebody's your girl and you need her help, and you realize she can't give it to you. Um, I think it might be a matter of two things is her willingness and her ability. Does she want to and she it's just not working? Or is it like a she doesn't even want to try to do what you've asked her to do? I think those are maybe two different issues, especially if we spell it out like, hey, you know, maybe if you did this, it would be helpful. If she's telling you, you know, hey, I hear you, but I can't do that. We do have to make choices at those crossroads. Okay, do I accept that she can't and, you know, turn to someone else? Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll kind of tell women this is where being plugged into community can be really helpful because I know we tend to use like friendship and community synonymously and sometimes our friends offer community. But again, going with like the new parent thing, I know for me, I was one of the first in my friend group to have children. So sometimes I did feel like, you know, I'm sharing something that was hard and they're like, oh, girl, I know what you mean. And then they share their hard thing. And I'm like, OK, yes, that's also hard. You know, so just the, just those things. Right. Um, and it was helpful when I started going to mommy groups, which I did not want to go to. I was like, I'm not going to be that girl. My husband's like, you need help. And it was so affirming to that aspect of my identity to have women who were like, oh, girl, OK, th this is what I did. This is what. Oh, my God. Thank you. I found myself less frustrated with my friends because I no longer was looking for you to give me this very specific niche affirmation and support. So I guess it's like a case by case basis, but at least knowing we have the option to supplement our friendships with specific communities might help everybody be a little more at ease. <laughs> Is my I thought? love that word, yeah. supplement. Yeah. You're not replacing or you're supplementing. Yeah. You're supplementing. I definitely get that. I know something that I have struggled with in friendships. I have some some core wounds, childhood wounds that I'm working through around abandonment with friendships. A lot of people mm -hmm. talk about abandonment as if a parent abandoned you, as if that's kind of the only way that that can affect you. I didn't have that experience. I more so had social abandonment and feeling like friends growing up didn't show up for me or, you know, being stood up by friends or excluded and things like that. And I've had instances where I do have friends who maybe go through life transitions who want to still be included and invited, even though I know they're going to say no. Mm. For me, I then get triggered because I'm like, well, this is just another example of people not showing up for me. And so while I would love to extend you the invitation to soothe your feelings about not having FOMO, it then hurts my feelings because totally. I know you're going to say no. And yeah. then it makes me feel like no one's showing up for me yeah. and figuring out how to manage, okay, how do we ease both of our triggers at the same time mm -hmm. <laughs> when we need kind of opposite things can sometimes be a little bit of a dance in friendships that I'm still learning. Totally. Oh my gosh. And I appreciate you saying that so much because I know there are women listening who are like, yes, same, right? Um, yeah, it's hard. I think that um, sometimes even front loading those conversations, because what I notice is, again, just as a theory is just that a lot of times when we don't meet each other's needs or we're missing one another or we make certain decisions, I think some women jump to uh, what's called fundamental attribution error. And the idea is that um, if I fall short, it was due to my circumstances. If you fall short, it's due to like your character. And so I think sometimes we reach right to like, I can't believe she's acting like that or she's this kind of person. I didn't know she was that kind of person or this kind of, and we kind of like conflate the thing with her character. And I think we start to question, does she even care? I mean, at the heart of everything, like, you know, we get into the details, which are important because we need to know how to get into the day-to-day -day business of being friends. But if we like took an aerial view and looked at it, the questions we're trying to answer, are, do you care? Do you love me? Do you see me? So if at the end of the day, a friend is like, well, I just need you to keep inviting me, even if I say no, because that makes me feel like you care. And you're like, okay, well, I'm only going to do that so much because hearing no feels like rejection. So I'm not going to keep putting myself out there in that way. How do we answer the question for each other? Here's my preference and my, and my uh, complexes. And here's what makes me feel cared for. So if I can say, girl, I'm not going to keep doing that because it sucks to have you say no. I love you but I'm not going to do that. You know, so I'm still kind of reassuring you. I care about you and I do want your company there. 
but can you consider my perspective? It's hurtful, okay? That way, at least when the invitations stop coming, she's less likely to assume it's because you don't care. I explained to you why those things aren't coming. I still very much care, but for me, I can't do that anymore. That's so helpful. Mm -hmm. It's that open communication so that we know where one another is coming from. Yeah. So, so helpful. Thinking more about some of the positive aspects of friendships, because I know we've talked people through the challenges and, and we can definitely talk more about that in some instances. I just want to make sure it's a balanced conversation. No pun intended. <laughs> Very I think, on brand. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think also people are looking for ways and support to either make new friends, whether they are in a new city, a new season. They're just feeling like, okay, I have some current friendships. I'm not really getting what I need and mm. I'm seeking external sources of support. Or maybe they have some of the acquaintances, or I know you've talked about kind of like weaker ties, people who you have looser connections with. Maybe they want to take that to the next level and strengthen some of those those friendships with potential acquaintances. What are some ways people can do that? Okay. Yes. I love this question so much because, you know, you do have people who are like, I want to know how to make friends. And some people are like, I have no problem meeting people. I have tons of people in my roster. It's just, I would like more depth. I feel like they don't know me. And so having the skill to move from acquaintance to deep friends is, is super important. So first I want to say, you know, make sure you've identified the right people you want to go deep with. Because some of us are trying to do that with people who either don't have the availability, they don't share the same friendship goals. So to your point earlier about, you know, how, you know, some people are intentional about friendship and they're prioritizing it right now. Others are, you know, it's on the back burner and they push it to the margins of their life and they kind of reduce it to something recreational when you need something to do on the weekend. So your friendship goals don't even align. So even identifying, okay, who are the people I want to be intentional about elevating to the next level in hopes that it would be reciprocal would be important. So you're not setting yourself up for hurt feelings. Okay. Um, but then there are three things that help us to have depth in a friendship. And I got this framework from Shasta Nelson, who's kind of like an OG in the friendship space, but she argues that we need positivity, consistency, and vulnerability to bring it from surface to depth. So, you know, I know it's, you know, starting with positivity. Yes, it's really um, important to have people we can vent to. Like that's one of the benefits. Okay. I have my girls and I can be like, oh, can I just be awful for a second, please. Like, can I have two minutes? <laughs> but when I zoom out, how many of our interactions are chronic complaining, venting? How many? Because the Gottmans um, who do research on relationships found that successful relationships have a positivity to negativity ratio of five to one. So because of how heavily negative exchanges weigh on us, we're going to need five positive to kind of override that. So that's the first thing. And if we're always negative, do I even really know you or are you just kind of like my venting buddy? Okay. The second thing for depth is that consistency. So do, how often do I see you? Right. Um, one thing I say here is that, you know, I know sometimes when we're besties, people will say to me like, oh, me and my bestie only talk two times a year. And we are, and I'm like, that's cool. I get it. I will also offer that sometimes you run the risk of you really only know what she chooses to self-report to you twice a year. So that's fine. I think maybe that speaks to y'all's chemistry, but do I really know you? And I've coached women who have told me like health things they got going on. And I'm like, so how do your friends show up for you in that? Oh, they don't know. You know, I'm, I, you know, I don't tell them that. It's like, wow. Okay. And then finally, vulnerability would be super important, which I know, you know, you've talked about and we've talked about super important. Um, just being open and feeling comfortable taking a risk of rejection. So you risk being rejected, but you also risk finding people who accept you. And that's important too. So having those three things to, to get a little more depth um, would be really important. Positivity, consistency, vulnerability. Yeah. So helpful. As you were talking, I was thinking through examples I've had on both ends. I'm like, oh, I know I've had friendships in the past where all we would do is get together and bitch about everything. <laughs> and it didn't friendships didn't get much stronger than that because yeah. you just come together. This would usually be work friends. I also yes. have this theory that a lot of work friendships are trauma bonds, but that's a that's another episode. <laughs> I can see that. I can see <laughs> that's that. another episode. Yes. Uh, consistency, I think, is also another really important one. And I have had a lot of personal realizations where I thought, you know, I don't want to have a ton of friendships where we get together Two, two or three times a year and I'm catching them up on the events. Mm -hmm. I want people who are a part of the events. I don't want to have every time we talk be a recap. I want you to be a part of what's been going mm -hmm. on. And that's been a really big mindset shift for me over the past few years that 
when I started prioritizing that, I've started feeling a lot more satisfied in my friendships. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, shared experiences are important and, and, um, I don't know. There are just so many things that we have that would have us believe we're staying in touch. Cause I'll be like, Oh, I watch your stories every day. Like you're my girl. I know what's going on with your life, but like, I want to do life with you. Like I want to experience new places with you. I want to chat for an extended period of time somewhere, you know? So it does require people again to those friendship goals who are like, yes, I'm willing to do it with you. And I too am no longer satisfied with, with the, you know, quarterly, recaps. Um, so I love that for you. And I think it's important for women to get to a place where they're like, okay, what can I do to fold that in? Now, one thing that I've offered, because especially for women in their mid thirties to forties, uh, the research tells us that we have the least amount of leisure time than any other generation. And again, it goes kind of back to what we said before, you know, we're in our prime. So we're probably hustling at work. You might have young children to care for. You might have aging parents you're caring for. You're starting to get to that, you know, um, you, you know, season. And so we have a lot going on. So we have less time to chill than other generations. So it feels difficult sometimes. Like time is the thing I hear people cite most of like, I mean, I would see my friends more, but, and so this sounds kind of corny, but uh, one thing that could help is something called a friendship ritual. So, you know, one of the things that gets in the way is constantly doing the mental labor of like, you, I mean, you know, there are jokes like, okay, can you do September 7th at two, doing that dance is exhausting. So how can we help bake consistency into the culture of this friendship. So whether that looks like, okay, every Friday at 10, we do our 15 minute catch up, our FaceTime, whatever, you know, every first Tuesday of the month, let's do the trivia night. That's kind of like our thing. But how can we put an aspect of our friendship on autopilot? So I know whatever's going on, I'm going to see you. And it also adds a layer of security to the friendship as well. So I think kind of baking those things in helps us to clock those hours that are essentially required to get closer. I love that. I love the idea of a ritual. Actually, last week on the podcast or the week before this aired, our guest had said that with one of her friends, she their friendship was at its strongest because every week they had a standing date to go grocery shopping together. Oh, we all yes. have to grocery shop. Yes, we all that. have to do it every yeah. week. <laughs> Might as well do it together. So they would get together. They would grocery, you know, they would ride to the store together. They would chat. They would grocery shop together. That was their quality time every week. And it doesn't have to be a big to do girls trip, Instagram, birthday dinner, oh my God. <laughs> high maintenance thing. Yes. I love that so much. One, because to your point, when it's something you've got to do anyway, invite them to come with you. It's not as sexy as the hours long brunches, but if the goal is I want to clock some hours with you, that might be how it looks is to have those friends you can run errands with. I also love that because a lot of people say, I want to, you know, see my friends more, but I don't have the money to drop a hundred dollars a weekend on catching up. And so it's very practical too that, that example of the running errands together. I think that's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. I had to say, I, had the seed planted for that. There was this episode of And Just Like That, like the Sex and the City reboot. Uh -huh. You know, it's controversial because uh -huh. it's not as good as the original. <laughs> but there was one episode where Carrie, I think she like dropped her laptop or something and needed to go to the Apple store. Mm -hmm. And then she brought her friend to the Apple store with her to get the new laptop. And I'm like, I could do that. Yeah. I could... I could bring my friend to the farmer or I could go with my friend to help her pick out things at the farmer's market if she needs it. Like, yes. oh, it's yeah. a whole new perspective that, yeah, we can do that. It can be easy. Yeah, it can. It really can be easy. And that's the thing is I always say, you know, I think as adults, we do say, you know, I don't have the time to hang out. But when we say hang out in our brains, the image we're pairing with that is late nights out or hours long brunches. And if that's how you see, like that's the imagery that's associated with hanging out, you're going to continue to say, I don't have time for that. But at some point we do have to rethink what it looks like. It's the come with me to pick up my kids, come with me to Target. And once we realize, oh, actually I have lots of those moments, we'll see there's so much, I mean, there's so much opportunity. Mm, that mm -hmm. just makes me so excited. <laughs> Yes, it's possible. everyone's homework. Run an errand with yes, your friends. Go to Target <laughs> with your bestie. Yes. Literally yesterday, me and my friend were talking about making a, a Costco run together because we're like, mm -hmm. we each have something each other needs. I have a Costco card. You have car. I think we can help each other. I, I mean, think, I think beautiful. we can work together yes. here. <laughs> yes, and it's and it's just that simple. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> so, what about making new friends and just establishing bonds with brand new people? Yeah. 
So that's the number one question I get. And um, normally it comes with some kind of qualifier. So people are like, well, how do I make friends as a new mom, a college grad? I'm in a new city. I hope that shows us we will always be having to make new friends. So starting right there, because some of us, you know, I hear people say, oh, I just feel like I should have like met my people. And, and we're stopping with that. Like I should have met my people you're always going to be making new friends. So we might as well adopt the skill of getting it done because you're going to do it again. When you get older and your kids leave the nest and now you got to do it again. Um, so so if anybody's in that season, I want them to feel totally validated. Um, so a couple things. I'll give you three things. Uh, the first is get comfortable leveraging technology. Now, Gen Z is very comfortable with this. They grew up in a world where they haven't known life without the internet. So they're more comfortable with the idea of being online and looking for friends. I think others are getting more open to that. But but, you know, there are apps like Bumble for Friends where people are, I, I like to say, almost expediting the process of finding your people, especially if you work unconventional hours. So I know a lot of um, nurses who have been clients have told me like, oh, I found my people there because maybe they can't fall into the fold of a traditional hang out at the bar or hang out at the gym kind of situation. So they can kind of look for friends at the time that's available to them. Or when people are in a new city and they're like, oh, I'm looking for more diversity. I don't know where people like me are. Then you can go to one concentrated space. So people are getting more comfortable, you know, leveraging apps like Bumble for friends. I think another thing that's really helpful is to, I always say, contact your super connectors. So these are people who like thrive on making introductions, right? Like the girl who's like, oh, Tina, you should meet my girl, Tiffany. Like that girl, okay? That girl. So even if she's not your friend, but you just know of her, there's no shame around reaching out, texting, DMing, and saying like, um, hey, I'm trying to get more plugged in. And I thought of you because, you know, you're always out and about and into something fun. And I was just wondering, like, do you know of any events around here that are worth checking out or, you know, any groups that I should look into? There's no shame around that. And the average person is flattered you considered them to help you out and who doesn't want to give their two cents. And on the more positive possible end, you might even get a plus one. You know, they might say, oh my God, yeah, I'm in a book club. You should come with me next month. But you cannot get the need met if you will not make that need known. So we got to stop with the whole, I don't want to look clingy. I don't want to look. Then how do we know how to help you? And the last thing I would say is um, to become a regular somewhere. I know we often, you know, we like romanticize when we were younger. It was so much easier. Well, we were in the same space with the same people for like nine hours a day. Friendships blossomed. Okay. It was inevitable. But right now we kind of have to like manufacture those opportunities for ourselves. And so there's something known as the mere exposure effect. And the idea is you tend to prefer things just because they're familiar to you. So how can you use that to your advantage? How can I work from the same coffee shop every Friday? for two hours. How can I, you know, walk my dog at the park, you know, at the same time every day. And I will say, I know as women, we have to be careful around having public routines, but, um, how can I become a regular somewhere? Because then I see the same faces and I feel a little less intimidated to say like, Oh, Hey, because I see you all the time on my walk. Um, so I think those are three ways to help us kind of get it done, but I'll end with this. I think one mindset, cause those are tactical one mindset that I think will change the game for people is, you have to adopt the identity of being a connector. It cannot be some behaviors, a set of behaviors you try out in moments of confidence. That's, that's you doing something. I know it sounds cheesy, but as soon as you say like, no, I'm, I'm a connector, that is who I am then those behaviors are an extension of who you are. So yes, I'm going to initiate the text. Yes, I'm going to be like, girl, do you want to come to Target? Without thinking, oh, I mean, what if she's busy? Or I don't want to look. Of course I'm doing. That's who I am. And I think adopting that can be empowering and we'll start to realize how many opportunities we really have. Mm, so good. Having both the mindset and the tactical because they work together. Yeah. It's hard to have one without the other. Mm -hmm. But I can't lie. As more of a woo-woo girly, what you just said about <laughs> the embodiment, I'm like, mm, mm hmm So, so good. Yeah. So, so good. Yeah. You also made a really interesting point there because it sounds like, you know, what we're doing with things like the consistency, you know, repeat exposure is almost kind of mimicking what we did have easily in childhood, which was being in a lot of the same spaces, 
spending time with the same people, which gave those relationships time mm -hmm. to develop and blossom. And we may not naturally have that in our schedules like we did when we were younger. Yeah. It's just as an interesting way to think of it. Yeah. And like I said, like think about like if you had to look at the ingredients or the formula that was helping you make friends, it was you were clocking hours together. And there's research that shows that it takes about 34 hours to take someone from an acquaintance to a friend. So how am I clocking hours with the girls who I've thought to myself, oh, she seems cool. Okay, great. Next step is we got to do something together, right? So, you know, we saw the same people. We spent a lot of time together. We had shared experiences. Those were the ingredients. We had maybe common struggles. We talked about, oh, this teacher's so annoying. We... It, it's the same things, but we do have to manufacture them a little bit and get strategic the way we would anything else. I mean, people are, you know, looking up dating podcasts and dating books because they're like, I need a strategy. Why do we still hold the idea that friendship should be like organic though? Like, I mean, come on. It's the same thing. Okay. What do I need to do to find some like-minded women and to create a relationship with them? It's, it's the same approach. I couldn't agree more. There's nothing wrong with being intentional about what you want. It mm -hmm. doesn't make it less valuable actually think it kind of makes it more valuable if you're intentional about it as opposed to just waiting for it to magically happen. Yes. Yes. I cannot agree more. Yeah. The whole like, it, it has to be organic. I mean, I've done videos sometimes and, you know, most of the, the, the comments will be positive. I mean, I'm not saying, oh, they're saying anything crazy, you know, but every now and then there will be somebody who's like, I'm not doing all that. I'm not doing all that. I don't have time for like all these scripts or like trying to like friendships just should be like natural and organic. I'm not, I'm not doing all that. And I hear that. What I choose to hear them saying <laughs> is that like this feels like a lot of energy and a lot of work. And I do want to validate a lot of us are burned out. We Capitalism, okay? We're burned out working all day, answering emails. We're burned out. We're financially stressed. I get it. But there's learned loneliness that is happening and we're getting comfortable being alone just because you're getting comfortable doing it doesn't make it good for you. So I'm not saying go out there and have parties every weekend, but I'm saying, how can I socialize my interests by just one degree? All the things I'd be doing by myself, who can I invite to share this moment with me? That's all I'm saying. And, and sometimes that's all it takes. Um, I'll end with this. There's a, a, a survey, the American Time Use Survey that came out. They found that in 2013, we were spending on average six hours a week with our friends. We now spend about two hours a week with our friends. And the decline started way before the pandemic. So it's not like a 2020 thing. We are opting to be alone. And with the convenience of, you know, I can, I don't have to go to the library. I can get my books on my Kindle. I don't have to go and get my food. I can have it DoorDash. I get those conveniences. I'm just encouraging people to think about the costs of convenience and what you are losing when you don't do those things. And I don't know, that's just a little rant, but it can be done. <laughs> like the socializing can be done and it's not as hard as we think it is. That was a fantastic rant. Oh, God, just a couple of those terms that you said, <laughs> I'm like, can we underline, you know, bold, <laughs> italicize? The cost of convenience, yeah. because I think convenience can cost us a lot of things in so many ways, be it friendships, relationships, wellness, mental health. I just, I, I really liked that terminology. I would also love to come back to what you just said, which was learned loneliness. Mm -hmm. What that, what is learned loneliness for people who may not be familiar with the term? Yeah. So I, I did a video on this and it had like mixed responses because people were like, I hear you, but... I'm still going to do what I do. And I'm like, I got you. Like, I hear you. But essentially, it's when you get comfortable being lonely. And there's all this data that shows that, you know, people haven't returned to pre-pandemic activities, which I I get. Um, I think it's something like 30% of people say it feels harder now to form relationships. They don't know what to say to one another. So you have all this data coming out that essentially says, we think relationships are hard. We'd prefer to spend time alone. We think relationships are less important than they were before. So like even our attitudes are changing. And even though it's becoming more common, doesn't mean it's beneficial. So there's just, I'm sorry, there's just way too much research that draws a direct line between your social support and your physical, mental, and emotional health. And the longest running study out of Harvard uh, on happiness uh, found that the number one thing that determines your physical wellness and your life satisfaction is the quality of your relationships, nothing else. They've been like, I think the study's still going over 80 years following people looking at every single thing. It keeps coming back to that. 
So I understand it's more comfortable sometimes to like leave the sweatpants on and Netflix. I'm, I'm totally going to do that. Okay. But when am I seeing people having conversations, sharing laughs, exchanging ideas, getting support for what I'm going through? You cannot substitute that with anything else. That's such an important point. And I'll, and I'll say this just as an example for people. Um, and, and I read this in an article, but I was like, oh, this is perfect. But the same way you haven't worked out for a long time, you're like, oh, God, I got to like physically get up and, uh, and push past to gain some momentum. It's the same thing. So I get that we're comfortable doing our own thing on the couch. How can you, uh, you know, <laughs> push past and be like, okay, let me call my girl. Or I was going to do this anyway. Let me invite them to come with me. It, it can be really that simple. Definitely. Yeah. I love the idea of thinking of it almost like a muscle yeah. that we can strengthen again. And I also really appreciate you highlighting that study, really just how important Im important social connection and support is for our overall health. Because mm -hmm. I think when we think of our wellness, we tend to get really locked in on you know working out, eating a certain way, and we can almost isolate ourselves mm -hmm. in that, especially if you're in your glow up journey, mm -hmm. self improvement <laughs> journey, we want to isolate ourselves in that and then reemerge as this new person in six months. But no amount of exercise can replace feeling supported yeah. and connecting with other people. And I think that there's just room for all of it, even if we need to get a little creative. Yes, getting creative. And, and you know, and I can already hear, I know there are probably some people too who are like, I don't know, maybe they find themselves in that position because they've been hurt. You know, I, I, you know, often hear people who are like, you know, well, I tried the friends thing and people disappoint you or I put in more energy than other people. And I hear that. I totally hear that. And I totally get how that would make anybody less motivated or optimistic about moving forward. To that person, I would also say that healing happens in community. Like you have to position yourself to have corrective experiences. So if I've had people disappoint me, I mean, that's unfortunate. That's something I have to work through. But I won't see, I will never experience people supporting me unless I put myself in the same position and give them a chance to show up for me. And then it updates the data that like the story I've downloaded in my brain, like, oh, okay, well, I don't know. People, I guess are okay. You know? So we have to put ourselves in those situations to kind of, you know, get the healing that we need. Definitely. I know, which is like such a not fun answer sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> the first time I read the book Attached, you know, about the yes. attachment styles, reading about, you know, are you anxiously attached? Are you avoidant? Whatever. And being like, okay, cool. So how do I fix it? And the answer is like, find a securely attached person. And I was ready to throw the book. I was like, I need my six. Steps. I thought you were going to tell yeah. me tactics. What do you mean? Yeah. You know, but it's true. It, yeah, it is funny. true that, that we can only heal so much in isolation. Mm-hmm. Speaking a little bit to maybe those situations where people have experienced friend hurt or uh, maybe navigating a friendship breakup, because I know that that can be a really devastating occurrence for some people. Do you have any kind of advice for how people can navigate those experiences without letting it harden them to the potential of, of new friendships and connections in the future? I love how you ask that, especially that word hard in them, because that's, oh my God, that's so what's happening. And it makes me um, really sad, but I get it. Um, yeah. So friendship breakups are going to happen. I think they're startling uh, because you might enter into a romantic situation, knowing that it's possible this might not work out, might not be the one, but you very rarely go into a friendship thinking, I don't know. This might not work out. You're just you're just in it. You're like, oh my God, I met this girl. She's so cool. Like you're not thinking, but if this doesn't work out, we just lean into it. So for that reason alone, it feels very disruptive when it's over because I never spent time entertaining the idea it would be over. So I've, I've got to work through mentally wrapping my mind around the loss, right? I think it's also difficult because there are fewer spaces. I mean, they're growing, but fewer spaces to even grieve that. You know, I often make the joke, like if you're hanging out with a bunch of girls and you're waiting on a friend to arrive, you know, and, and you tell the group, okay, you guys be careful tonight because she's going through a breakup. So she's a little sensitive. Everyone would be like, oh, totally get it. If I said she's going through a friend breakup right now. So just be, we'd be like, I'm sorry, what? Like, Okay. And the things that we tend to tell each other to help each other heal is, well, she was a fake friend anyway. Like you can get new friends, girl. We can replace her. It's dismissive. But with a love interest, we're like, oh my God, that sucks, girl. Like take all the time you need. So I say all that to say what makes it difficult is not having spaces 
to grieve it and to feel embarrassment that we can't get friendship right. What does that say about me? And it feels so much like failure, especially when you have people bragging about having friendships they've had for decades, which is a beautiful thing. There's something very special about having friends who have seen you through like all these evolu- you know, versions of yourself. But when we are using it as a measure of success, if for you relationship success equals longevity, then by extension, you'll feel like a failure when it's over. So at some point you need to kind of rethink What does friendship success look like for me? Is it we showed each other love in the best way we knew during college and I'm so, I thank God for your companionship where I went and got through and and I can be grateful for that. So just the reframe. In terms of like two tacticals to move forward, one is, it sounds corny, but the research shows if you can identify what you're grateful for during the friendship, you'll be better positioned to move forward without bitterness and resentment. So again, sounds cheesy. Maybe not for you if you're woo-woo. Like I'm like journal and like burn your paper. For the balanced black yeah. girls, they might be into that. I don't know if they like this podcast. Like you're speaking our language. I'm like, it's a little woo-woo. But you know, so that's helpful. Okay. You know, I think she's, you know, she was kind of awful to me, but you know, I guess I wouldn't have gotten through that period without her. I gotta give her that. You know, or I guess she put me onto some things that that I need. I gotta give her that. It just helps. It helps. Um, and then another thing is what are some of the things you've been avoiding or not leaning into because that friendship sucked you in? You know, are there hobbies you put off or things you didn't pursue because, I don't know, maybe subconsciously you felt like it would pull you away? Like, go explore those things now. And I'm not saying replace her. You can't replace her. But what are things you've been putting off to keep that friendship on the on track? Now's your time to pursue those people and to pursue those things. And I think together those things will, you know, will allow us to move forward. So good. So, so good. That point that you made at the beginning about we go into romantic relationships knowing that a breakup is a possibility, but we don't think that way about friendships. I'd never thought about that before until you said it. And I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense because we don't think that. We don't make friends with a new person and be like, can't wait to fall out with her in a year. You know, we don't (laughs) think that. We just think now this person is my friend. And, you know, you just – I think that's why for some people friendship breakups can be even more devastating Mm -hmm. than romantic breakups because, yeah, romantically there could be a part of you that is – knows it's a possibility and – it it is the natural order of things sometimes versus with friendships. I don't think we are ever really expecting it until it starts to happen. Yeah. I, no one's thinking that way. And, you know, and I know I compare like men and women a lot and it's just because I specialize in the research on women's friendships. But I do think it's interesting that, you know, uh, the research finds that women tend to integrate their friends into their lives to the degree of a sibling, men to the degree of a cousin. So naturally, it's probably going to be painful for me to lose you because you are my sister. I, and friendship is also like at the center of our identity work. So, I mean, I'm not afraid to say like part of the reason I feel like I am funny and cool and interesting is because my friends think so. So it makes me look at myself like, okay, maybe I am cool maybe because they see that in me. You know what I'm saying? And so when it's over... You can't help but to think, am I funny and interesting and lovable? If if she will withdraw her friendship from me, what does that say about me? But with a romantic partner, we can dismiss it as like, oh, whatever. He's not the one. Plenty of fish in the sea. And so there's just something about, especially with the with another woman who sees me and then opting to withdraw, I can't help but to question what I lack. And so, you know, I just want to validate the woman who's like still torn up over a loss from six years ago. I think that's totally normal. And to allow yourself to grieve it. Yeah. It is a lot of grief mm-hmm. to, to feel for sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. Oh, God. Yeah. It's just – it's <laughs> sort of those things where it's like we've we've all experienced our own versions of it. Yeah. And just navigate it the best we can mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do also want to – give people a bit of hopefulness. I know our audience is primarily millennial and Gen Z. So our listeners are mostly 20s and 30s. And I think for people in their 20s, I mean, the 20s are just a rough decade. It's just as like everything feels like a crisis. Everything <laughs> feels like it's on fire. 
like you said, that mid twenties time is a weird time for friendships. I also want to give people a little bit of encouragement that you may not have that proximity Mm -hmm. to friends, to make friends like you did when you were younger. But the cool thing about being an adult and making friends as an adult is that you can form friendships over things beyond proximity. Mm. It can be shared interests, shared values, common ground versus when you're a kid, it's like, oh, you're on my team. You're in my class. You live in my neighborhood. We're friends. Yeah. But then how <laughs> how compatible are you really? Is it proximity or is it a genuine bond? And I think the cool thing about being an adult, which I want people to feel hopeful about as they embark in new friendships, is like you get to choose what you bond with people over. Yeah. And that actually could lead to stronger bonds because you're connecting over something stronger than just we're in the same class and yeah. that's it. Like you could have more in common and that could be a good thing. Yeah, that's so I I love that you made that point. That's you're totally right. Um that and now proximity is like a a a bonding agent and you know research does find that people who tend to be close like I see you all the time, you become my friend. That's why as adults like the number one place we make work as adult or make friends as an adult is in the workplace just cuz you're next to me. You're here. So that is true. But it can work to our advantage the opposite way. So if I find somebody I like for other reasons or I want to draw closer to them for other reasons, I have to work to increase our proximity, like to see you more. You know what I'm saying? So if I know that's a bonding agent, how can I use it for people who aren't so easily accessible to me and we can get creative around how we can make that happen? But yeah, I love that point. And, you know, I often offer to people who are like, I don't really know where to even find different people unless they're just, you know, people I just see. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll be friends with you, you know, is to, you know, do this exercise is think about, you know, how you would complete the statement. I am blank, like whatever that descriptor of your identity would be. So for me, I might say, I am black. I am a woman. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a Christian. I'm a, whatever those things are. How are you in community for each one of those things to affirm your identity? So I need to be around other black women because they just, I mean, shorthand, they get it. Okay. You know, I need to be around other moms sometimes so I can be like, man, I'm kind of like struggling. I, I I don't know. I'm falling short. I need to be around, you know, people who share my faith sometimes because, you know, we share similar worldviews. So if you're like, I don't know where to start, that could be one way to know the direction of where to lean into to form bonds based on different things. That is such a great exercise. That is your homework, everybody. <laughs> I also just love through this conversation. I'm like, oh, I, I feel the teacher. I feel it. And that is yeah. so good. That exercise of identifying your identities and the identities that you want to form bonds with other people over. I'm like, I know I'm doing it in my journal tonight. Yeah. So I want y'all to do it too. <laughs> it's helpful. It's just something tactical to help us see all that is available to us instead of scrolling social and seeing everybody else looking so plugged in and being like, oh my God, I'm so behind. So I just feel like something like that can help us kind of see, okay, I have some power and authority in my situation. Let me figure out what I need and what I need to do to access that. So good. Mm -hmm. So good. Danielle, this was all so helpful. I love how we had tactical takeaways. I love how we had mindset shifts that people can apply. So before we wrap up, I just kind of want to see what you're looking forward to this year, what your plans are for 2024 and tap in. Yeah. So 2024 is super exciting because this is the year that my book comes out. So my book comes out in May. It's titled Fighting for Our Friendships. And it's just all about, you know, helping us understand the mechanics of women's friendships along with tacticals to navigate the day-to-day business of being friends. And so I like to tell people I, I am not pitching this book as like, this is the book. I hope you have tons of friendship books on your bookshelf. I would love for this to be one of them, but I hope that you have a lot of literature. So, you know, to the point we made at the beginning of the the show about a lack of literature got me into this, I hope women are like, you know what? I'm pouring so much into being a better parent, student, girlfriend. What are you doing with the same energy to be a better friend and have better friendships. And I'm just hoping that, you know, some of what I'm doing is getting us a little bit, a little bit closer. So I'm so excited um, for this year specifically for that. Amazing. It absolutely is. (laughs) We'll put a link in the show notes so that folks can pre-order. So when y'all pre-order now, then you'll get it as soon as it comes out in May. I'm so excited for it. Yeah. I appreciate y'all. Yeah. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. such an exciting thing. Yeah. 
Are you going to be going on tour? We're looking into that, like how to bring the experience around. Um, Because I know a lot of times you go to a book thing and they read an excerpt from the book and everybody claps and like, yes, that would be amazing for my ego. But we're also considering things like maybe speed friending and and taking that around. And, you know, that way you can come and it's it's an experience. So um, so we'll see what's what's happening you can you can stay tuned and we'll see what's to come amazing well yes people need to follow you for updates because I feel like you doing events supporting your book is the perfect place for people to make friends yeah so. yeah I encourage people I mean if you're trying to to make more friends it might be speed friending at one of my events and and on Instagram I'm at friend forward um or you know we mentioned earlier you know bumble for friends I love hearing success stories there so that's a, a great place to to get it going too but I appreciate you for facilitating a moment to have this conversation and pour some much attention to it. And I also really respect the way you are so responsive to this community's needs and what they share with you, what they're interested in, and and then you feed it back to them. So I appreciate you for for making time to have this conversation and allowing me to like lend my voice to it. Thank you so much. Well, I really love your work and it was an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. So one more time where people can find you, where they can listen to your podcast. Yeah. Everything lives at betterfemalefriendships.com. Perfect. So we'll have that linked in the show notes. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of Balanced Black Girl Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really, really helps the show. It is how we get new listeners and it's what helps us book our amazing guests. We're always trying to provide a five-star experience here. So if you enjoyed it, please leave us five stars. And we're also now on YouTube. Beyonce may be withholding the visuals, but I am not. So if you like Balanced Black Girl, make sure you subscribe to the Balanced Black Girl YouTube channel for new video episodes every Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next week.